thank you. It's nice to be uh, back in Tokyo, seeing old friends and distinguished uh, diplomats and academics. Uh, and the topic of uh, Trump's foreign policy uh, is certainly one which should get us into a good discussion because it is a great puzzle, I'm sure, not only to my Japanese friends, but also to many Americans. Uh, we have not seen a foreign policy, or indeed a president, like Trump before. Uh, when Trump campaigned in 2016, he was the first presidential candidate of a major party in 70 years who called into question what's been called the liberal international order or the set of institutions and rules and alliances which were created at the end of World War II and which provided a good deal of stability in the world uh, for 70 years. Uh, Trump uh, challenged this. He wanted what he called an America first policy, which uh, would be a policy which would uh, judge things not by alliances and institutions, but by the short-run advantage that it provided to the United States. In that sense, he reflected his background as a man who grew up in New York uh, City real estate deals. People sometimes call him a businessman. He's not a businessman. He's a real estate dealer. <laughs> and that often has a short-term perspective and a zero-sum perspective. And if you think about alliances, alliances uh, are uh, not based on short-term deals. They're based on long-term relationships, more like a marriage. And uh, that's not been Trump's strong point. In any case, uh, the good news and bad news of the Trump foreign policy, so far as we understand it, after uh, you know, 10 months in office, uh, is that some things have not been as bad as what he said he would do in the campaign, but uh, some things have been as bad, and there is still some areas where it may become worse. Let me give you an example. In the area of alliances in the security sense, the good news is that he backed away from many of his threats. For example, during the campaign, he said NATO is obsolete. <laughs> but a few months into his presidency, he decided that NATO uh, was not obsolete, that it still was important. Uh, during the campaign, he did not pay close attention to the Japan-U.S. alliance, which has been the bedrock of stability for American strategy. Uh, and he even talked at one point about maybe Japan should develop its own nuclear weapons for its security. Uh, but Prime Minister Abe very cleverly went to New York in December, even before Trump was president, developed a good personal relationship and that combined with the fact that the establishment in American politics, the people in the congressional committees, the civil servants, the military, have all got a very deep uh, appreciation of the importance of the Japanese alliance. And that meant that uh, we had a reaffirmation of the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty. So the threat that Trump posed in the campaign that he was going to tear up the security structure uh, turned out uh, to be a, a, a threat, but not one that was implemented. On the other hand, the liberal international order was not just security, it was also based on uh, uh, institutions and economic relations. And that's where we see more difficulty. Trump withdrew American participation Paris Accords, the UN efforts to <coughs> reach uh, agreement on ways to deal with the dangers of climate change. Uh, and he has also talked about uh, making radical changes in trade. He looks at trade from the point of view of surpluses 
and deficits rather than overall benefits. Now, most economists say that you don't judge trade in a bilateral framework of surpluses and deficits. You can judge it in terms of overall benefits. One country's surplus may be another country's deficit and vice versa. But uh, for Trump, having a surplus which creates or contributes to a deficit bilaterally with the United States is a sin. Uh, it's something bad. And the net effect of this is that he has tried to uh, avoid multilateral arrangements and to go to bilateral arrangements where he will try to bargain for balanced trade. He says he's not anti-trade, but that he wants a fair trade, and fair trade means a series of bilateral balances. This has led him, obviously, to uh, not implement TPP, to withdraw from TPP uh, right away, but it's also led him now to renegotiate the North American Free Trade Agreement, uh, which would be uh, quite devastating for uh, Mexico and Canada, uh, as well as uh, negative effects on the U.S. economy. But when you look at uh, who's next in line in terms of uh, trade surpluses, it'll be China, and then Japan, and then Germany. And uh, we haven't seen uh, the damage that could be done in these areas yet, uh, partially because they haven't got there. Uh, Trump's trade, uh, special trade representative, Lighthizer, uh, is not a fan of the World Trade Organization. The Americans have gone slow on appointing new judges for the dispute settlement mechanism. And uh, the big question will be, uh, will Trump impose tariffs on trade, which will be severely damaging to the World Trade Organization and the rules-based international system we've seen there. Uh, many of my friends in Washington who follow this closely fear that will be the case. The third question, of course, it, in terms of uh, Trump's foreign policy, is how will he handle the relationships with China? And China is a rising power. It's an $11 trillion economy. Uh, the U.S. is a $20 trillion economy. But many people see China as a challenge to the U.S., and some even see it as a threat. Uh, Trump spoke very harshly about China during the 2016 campaign, but then when he first came into office, he did some rather strange things. For example, he raised the prospect of trading uh, our attitudes toward Taiwan for trade concessions. He dropped that fairly quickly. Uh, but then when he met with Xi Jinping at Mar-a-Lago in February, uh, he basically said to Xi Jinping, you help me with my problem of North Korean nuclear weapons and deliver Kim Jong-un, and I'll go <coughs> easy with you on the threats of sanctions on trade, which I have uh, threatened. Uh, one of the problems with that, of course, is it's not at all clear that Xi Jinping can deliver Kim Jong-un. Uh, the North Koreans don't really like the Chinese all that much, and for years the Chinese have been reluctant to put too much pressure on uh, North Korea for fear of creating instability on their borders. So right now what you're seeing is a war of rhetoric in which Trump is uh, basically using words, but they have <coughs> talked about the possibility of using force as well. And one of the interesting questions is whether Trump will be able to push the Chinese uh, by creating a sense of fear so that Xi Jinping will say, I must do more about North Korea, because if my priority is to avoid chaos on my border, the worst chaos would be a war, and uh, this man Trump might be just dangerous enough to get us into that. We don't know how that will turn out. It's a game and play, and of course Trump is going to visit Asia and Asian capitals uh, at the beginning of November, so we'll 
understand a little bit more at that point. Uh, finally, just to, to wrap this up, um, on the Middle East, uh, Trump has uh, threatened to uh, draw back from the Iran nuclear agreement. Uh, he claims this is the worst deal that's ever been signed. Uh, he has stopped uh, certifying uh, the agreement to the Congress and said it's up to the Congress as to whether they reimpose sanctions. Reimposing sanctions would in fact uh, scuttle the deal and would make the Middle East a far more dangerous place. So uh, we don't know how this is going to turn out. Again, whether it's more rhetoric than reality, but it is a, a danger. Uh, and there is, of course, then the Russian involvement in the Middle East, where the uh, Russians in Syria uh, have to decide how much they're going to stay involved and how much they want to work closely with the Iranians and the fear that creates among the Sunni states that there'll be a Shia crescent from, uh, all the way from Tehran to Beirut, right through the heart of the Middle East. And uh, on that issue, uh, Trump has gone to Saudi Arabia and uh, uh, tried to reaffirm the U.S. position with the Sunni Arabs. In, in fact, he has hoped to get Sunni Arab help on the uh, Israeli-Palestine issue, uh, but thus far there are no results and things don't look particularly promising. So the issue of the Middle East is, is very much again up in the air. So to go back to where I started from uh, on Trump's foreign policy, much of it is a game in play. Uh, and the, uh, the good news is that uh, on the alliance structure, and in particular from the point of view of Japan, the centrality of the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty as the basis for U.S. policy in East Asia, that looks okay. Uh, the bad news is that on institutions, and, uh, and the, uh, particularly institutions in the area of trade and environment, uh, things do not look promising. And on the questions of uh, war and peace and how we deal with the key questions of uh, North Korea and uh, Iran, uh, the game is still in play. We just don't know how this is going to work out. So I would say to summarize that uh, on the Trump foreign policy, uh, a has barely a passing grade. He passes barely because he has reaffirmed the alliance structure, but uh, in terms of the other aspects of <coughs> good foreign policy, uh, so far he has failed. So that's, uh, that's my view. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Nye. It's uh, great to be with you. Uh, if, if after, the, you know, after Mr. Trump and after the immediate uh, victory over Abe in the general election, it will be nice to uh, talk about a little bit uh, the Trump administration and the Japan's uh, uh, administration and uh, also U.S.-Japan alliance. Uh, by the way, I'm a Nabe Watanabe. I'm a senior fellow at the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. That's an independent think tank in Tokyo. Uh, one thing: Should I talk to camera? <laughs> uh, which one? This one. Okay. So, um, one thing actually, the, the professor Nai suggested uh, the very uh, idiosyncratic uh, character of uh, uh, president of the United States and also a very unpredictable direction of uh, U.S. policy, especially the, I think, a trading side. Uh, and uh, even the foreign policy side, that's a little bit complicated because, uh, for example, TPP uh, originally planned in uh, not only uh, just uh, uh, trade policy, but also that's a very strategic uh, connotation of uh, element. That uh, clearly, the, what kind of uh, the liberal order, uh, international liberal order, or public goods providing in uh, Asia Pacific, and uh, 
what kind of a best way to persuade China to uh, follow the common rule in the region, especially that that's very serious in the South China Sea, East China Sea. So uh, I think Japan was somehow understand how important uh, the TPP, not only for the common trade economic rule, but uh, the creating some at atmosphere the, for the, the general international rule, especially the regional. So um, the decision of uh, the Mr. Trump to drop out uh, TPP was uh, disappointed, especially the the issue the, uh, with uh, China, how to deal with the rise of China. But uh, the very peculiar one is, of course, we don't know what kind of direction uh, now the Trump administration is heading toward China, especially uh, dealing with North Korea, a little bit uh, puzzling. And, uh, uh, one thing uh, uh, I could, we could know is that uh, the somehow the consensus of Japanese people, Japanese government, uh, like-minded people is that uh, anyway, alliance uh, with the U.S. is uh, very important. And uh, probably Trump administration may consuming a very good accumulation of the soft power of the U.S. in the region. And uh, it's uh, the reducing but are still very important for Japan to cooperate, <coughs> and probably sometimes to help to the, such a the, uh, the, uh, the weaker soft power of U.S. than before. And uh, Abe is elected, of course, it's a, it's a kind of a with luck kind of, because uh, Abe administration is not so popular, uh, the supporting rate of cabinet is not so high. But the uh, one is uh, due to the uh, very the bad tactics of opposition, split at opposition. Abe was uh, somehow uh, surviving. But that's good news for the, the foreign policy. I think uh, somehow Japanese uh, audience and constituency is uh, wise enough to the asking Abe to tackling, tackling on this very difficult Asia Pacific uh, things. Because uh, the good chemistry, somehow Prime Minister Abe has a good relation with uh, uh, the Mr. Trump. And uh, also, that is uh, backed by the common understanding of uh, Japanese uh, government and uh, probably some like-minded like to several policy community. Uh, still, the uh, alliance, stable U.S.-Japan alliance, is uh, the, the very key factor to manage uh, regional st stability. So, uh, very recently, I talked with my Japanese colleague about it, about uh, how to deal with uh, uh, Pre President Trump. Well, Japanese are all determined to maintain a good relation with the United States because we believe that's important for the survival of Japan and the stability of the region. So the, no question about it. And uh, also engaging uh, parties, uh, the, uh, the sep many important uh, st staff uh, and uh, the, the cabinet member of the Trump administration is a good uh, understanding of regional stability and uh, strong support of alliance. So, uh, especially the, the Secretary of, uh, Secretary of uh, Defense, uh, uh, Mattis, he first came to Japan and showed very uh, strong support of, to uh, alliance. And uh, uh, Secretary of State of Tirasson and uh, the, the Chief of Staff, uh, uh, Kerry. And, uh, uh, National Security of uh, McMaster. And uh, their signal to the, even uh, uh, Mr. Trump is uh, the shaky words to the, uh, the rocket, man, rocket man to the Kim Jong-un. Uh, very well balanced, uh, total message as, uh, the, uh, from uh, uh, cabinet. That's a good sign. And uh, uh, combined with a good chemistry of uh, uh, the uh, Trump Abe, and also very good stuff uh, surrounding uh, Trump. Somehow, uh, Japan really tried to maintain the closer alliance. And, uh, and that's the, so far we could say about that. And also, uh, the result of our current uh, election show a continuity, good continuity of our alliance. And also, good opportunity for Japanese people to think about it. How important uh, US soft power now? Because as if a soft power is uh, taking a granted, uh, like uh, air or water, people don't appreciate. But uh, Mr. Trump is a kind of challenge. What is a soft power of the United States? 
uh, in the region. I think uh, that's a very good opportunity too. And uh, uh, as an independent think tank, for example, uh, we are thinking about uh, what kind of implementation, implementation of uh, Japan's uh, new security registration uh, in the context of uh, US-Japan alliance, and also what Japan can do contribution to the uh, proactive contribution to the peace in the, the region. So for example, Japan is uh, uh, somehow engaged in uh, capacity building in the region. That's very important for the more important from now on. So I say it's time to think about it. So uh, Mr. Trump is a good opportunity for Japanese to think about the proactive contribution to peace that in the regional stability and alliance. So that's all. It's my honor to see Professor Nai and distinguished colleagues yeah. uh, I haven't talked to Professor Nai so long, but my advisor here, Richard Cooper, was a great teacher of this field, political, political economy. And I feel very pleased to see you today. And about the soft power, soft power is a kind of in means to control others without using power. And for example, why Tokyo graduates uh, have some advantage for others, maybe have. So it is a good way to stabilize the society. At the same time, society and other institutions have many conventions that may not be useful for the society as well. Uh, Mr. T uh, I first say I completely agree that trade staff members of uh, the Trump administration could be very dangerous for the world system or partners, trade welfare. I, I had the luck to be able to see both uh, Mr. Wilbarros and Mr. Robert Lighthizer in a day, within a day in Washington. And uh, for example, uh, the USTR said that uh, we, as I said, Japanese deficit, uh, Japanese surplus to U.S. is much, much smaller than the U United, than the China's. Uh, however, he said, if you divide by the population, uh, China's <laughs> harm is benign, but uh, who is suffering from this uh, is the United States. So it's that kind of uh, half legal, uh, Naive or very rigid thinking was not helpful. On the other hand, for the macroeconomic matters and so forth, economic policies of <coughs> Trump administration are not necessary or wrong. Uh, I think the Frank type of uh, over regulations uh, is working against the natural mechanism of international finance, and that sometimes make Japanese economics type of expansionary monetary policy to s stop working and. Uh, uh, 
simply speaking, the stock market is not completely dumb. I don't say stock market shows the exact state of the world, but because after Mr. Trump went to Washington, or the elected stock market in the US and in Japan, I keep sort of floating. And that is because of the deregulation and also some kind of honne, true intention rather than expressed what type of Trump administration. If I praise more than my wife, an American, will really hurt and argue against me. But uh, there are some aspects that suddenly straight speedball pictures is changed to miraculous uh, change of pace uh, and the economy, the world economy is a little bit uh, softened by his unexpected uh, things. And there is, uh, just to finish, one element people sometimes uh, misunderstand. Globalism is a good thing for using different ideas, different talents, and so forth. That, uh, that has to be limited for any country's national welfare. If Mexico and US stop its border, then the wage level of Mexicans will be equated to the U.S. level. And so there must be some egoism, egotism of the U.S. countries and probably people just said uh, globalism is good and also, of course, trade has the same sort of effect. And uh, the rage of American white uh, the people can be understood. I recently tried my project syndicate article in English and my friend said, why don't you put through Google Translate? I said, N -n -n my assistants even cannot do it properly to express my word, but what it came is uh, something a little better than bad research assistant. So by a artificial intelligence, the world is replacing so many workers. And uh, unfortunately, Japanese school education produced so many talents that can be replaceable by artificial intelligence in that list. They can remember where they can calculate fast, etc. But that can be replaced. Uh, and what we need is real uh, and progressive. Thank you. Well, I would like to welcome you, uh, Professor Nai, once again. And uh, I think you chose a very good timing uh, because uh, we just had uh, two typhoons. One <laughs> was natural, <laughs> another was political. Uh, well, the, uh, the real typhoon uh, left some uh, <coughs> casualties, unfortunately. But uh, the outcome of the general election was a good one. Uh, I'm very uh, happy to see uh, once again a stable government in this country. And uh, this is uh, good not only for Japan, but also for uh, our alliance. Uh, I'd like to uh, touch upon uh, a couple of uh, things. Uh, first, I'd like to say something about uh, the Japan-US uh, alliance. 
as you said, uh, when <coughs> I heard uh, Mr. Trump's uh, statements uh, during the election campaign, I was very worried uh, because he said that uh, <coughs> uh, the U.S. Uh, allies uh, should, should take care of themselves and uh, eventually uh, the U.S. Uh, would withdraw its uh, forces from Japan. And if, as a result, uh, Japan goes nuclear, that will be fine, he said. Uh, but uh, in light of uh, his uh, subsequent uh, statements, I was uh, a bit uh, believed. Uh, and uh, I, I, I thought that uh, he, he understood the importance of the Japan, of the Japan-US alliance. To what extent he understands, I, I don't know. Uh, but uh, another good thing is that, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> so sorry. Uh, one good thing is that uh, uh, the Prime Minister Abe uh, started uh, a good uh, personal relation with uh, uh, Mr. Trump. Uh, and uh, usually with uh, 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 conventional uh, President of the United States, uh, we can rely not only on personal relations but also on the uh, supporting um, structure of the, the U.S. government. But uh, it doesn't seem that uh, Mr. Trump has uh, uh, organizational support uh, so far. Uh, so um, I think uh, the personal relations between Mr. Abe and Mr. Trump uh, is perhaps uh, more important than in, uh, with other, uh, so, called, so, so to speak, conventional presidents. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, in this context, I think it is, a very good, it, it is a good news that uh, Mr. Trump is uh, going to visit Japan uh, shortly after the, uh, after the uh, formation of uh, Mr. Abe's uh, fourth cabinet. Uh, and uh, I hope very much that uh, Mr. Trump will understand the uh, realities uh, in this part of the world uh, much better. Uh, and uh, also, he, I hope that he would understand uh, uh, the problems that we are facing with, uh, faced with uh, in this uh, part of uh, Asia uh, better. Uh, that is one thing. Uh, the second thing is about uh, North Korea. Um, I don't know, uh, we, nobody knows uh, what uh, we should do with North Korea. Uh, of course, uh, we need to exert uh, pressure on North Korea, uh, but uh, we shouldn't have an illusion that North Korea would abandon uh, its uh, nuclear and uh, missile policy. Uh, I was uh, very much involved in the uh, U.S.-North uh, Korea negotiations uh, in the 90s, 1990s. Uh, of course, uh, Japan was not a party to the uh, negotiation, but uh, we were uh, very closely briefed uh, almost uh, on a daily basis by the uh, United States. Uh, and uh, as we all know, uh, it uh, led to the conclusion of the, the so-called agreed framework, but uh, we were all cheated by North Korea. Um, and uh, <coughs> at that time, uh, even the freezing of uh, the nuclear program of North Korea was uh, difficult. Uh, but it is even more difficult to, to freeze it or to uh, uh, make it abandoned by uh, North Korea. 
uh, I think uh, North Korea would never, never uh, abandon uh, its uh, nuclear uh, program. So what to do? Uh, so um, one is uh, to accept North Korea as a, a nuclear powered uh, nation. Uh, not not accept, accepting, uh, I, I don't mean that uh, we should uh, uh, accept North Korea as a nuclear power in the sense of uh, the uh, non-proliferation uh, treaty, but uh, uh, as a de, de facto uh, nuclear power. Uh, that is uh, one option. Another option is to use force. But uh, the second option would be uh, a very, very big uh, disaster. So I, I don't have uh, a very, very good <coughs> idea to, uh, about uh, the solution uh, to this uh, problem. Uh, and uh, I wonder whether uh, Mr. Trump has any idea about that. I, I don't think he has, he, he has it. Um, so that is a, a big uh, uh, problem. And uh, uh, the third point is about uh, uh, the U.S.-China uh, relations. Um, as you said, uh, Professor Dai, uh, I think uh, <coughs> Mr. Trump wants to make a deal with China. Uh, by uh, asking China to uh, influence uh, uh, North Korea. Uh, and uh, uh, in return, uh, Trump, Mr. Trump uh, seems to uh, try to give some concession to uh, China in, in the trade area. Uh, but um, the, this deal would be a, a very difficult one in the sense that uh, for two reasons. One is that uh, China has not uh, that much influence on North Korea. And uh, on the contrary, I think China needs uh, North Korea uh, as a, a kind of buffer state uh, between uh, uh, China and the United States stationed in the, in the Korean, on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, the second uh, problem is that uh, I, I think I don't think that uh, uh, Mr. Trump cannot resolve uh, trade uh, deficit against uh, China bilaterally uh, because uh, there is a structure structural problem uh, in the uh, U.S. China trade in that. Uh, many uh, American companies uh, uh, produce their own products in China and import them uh, under their own brands. Uh, so that is a structural problem. And uh, that is not just uh, uh, buy and uh, sell and uh, sell and buy uh, relation. So uh, I'm afraid that uh, Mr. Trump has not uh, understood of the, uh, the issue. Uh, <coughs> finally, um, the, uh, as I said already, uh, I'm very uh, worried about the possible uh, use of force uh, after, uh, after uh, any negotiation between the United States and North Korea uh, have, uh, um, have uh, not reached uh, a good uh, result. Uh, use of force can be triggered by any uh, small incident. As uh, we saw in the First uh, World War, uh, one shot uh, uh, by a Serbian uh, guy uh, triggered the first uh, world, war, uh, world war. So that uh, may happen also in this uh, uh, situation. And uh, the, uh, the casualties uh, would be beyond our imagination.
this. So uh, I think uh, I should spot, stop at this point. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, as uh, N.I. Sun talked about uh, election here, I'm saying uh, to uh, people that uh, the election result uh, came around this way because of three Ks. K Keizai, Japanese economy has been doing pretty well. It, uh, and uh, I think it's like stupid, it's economy. Economy is the base for uh, people's trust in this administration. Second, thanks to Kim, in a way. Uh, pe people need uh, strong leadership, stable leadership, uh, and they don't want really an inexperienced people to come in. That's point two. Point three, K is Kuike san no Kibo. And she made a blunder, really, in saying that uh, constitutional reform should be the uh, really a threshold to come into her party. Half the Japanese is not decided, and uh, she should have been a little more abstract, I think. Uh, that's uh, three cases, as I've been saying. As for uh, a security element of uh, Mr. Trump, uh, I agree with uh, Joe and I said uh, that uh, we are very much reassured that he came back to the traditional stance on many issues. I think if we look at uh, a house, we live in. Security is the basis of the house. So we need a very strong base. Now, other things like uh, trade, environment, all other issues are first story. And it's the first story has become a little too crowded. A good old friend of America said, let's make the second story. Let's make it more comfortable. Then, that's Paris Agreement, TPP, and other issues. Then the, the one who started saying that withdrew and said, I'm out. So we are making the second story ourselves and uh, waiting for good old friend who started this to come back. It's like uh, I'm always saying, Shane, come back. <laughs> we are always welcome. Uh, we hope that he will not really defy, challenge the very basic institution like WTO, IMF itself. There's some concern about it, as Joe mentioned, uh, but this is the very... Now, as for the soft power that uh, Watanabe-san mentioned, I think American strength is uh, not only military, and uh, it has been the soft power, uh, the Joe Nye's uh, naming, democracy, freedom of speech, uh, human rights, and uh, these very strong founding fathers' philosophy was the strength against China or any other country that U.S. had. It's not only economy and military. And uh, if the leader is not really putting too much emphasis on that, that weakens the U.S. stance in the world, and I, we are very much concerned about it. And also, a uh, racial issue uh, that is uh, now uh, occurring in the United States is some worrying to us as well. But we have seen United States pendulum swing from time to time, from here to here, with the administration so many times. And we hope that uh, this is not going all the way that's uh, how I felt. But uh, uh, in short, that's what I wanted to express here. And uh, I have more questions, but uh, uh, now everyone has spoken. And uh, Mita-san has asked me to be a moderator. We'll start free discussion from here. And uh, I will like to focus first on North Korea, which uh, Mr. Yanai has touched upon. And uh, I would like to f give first uh, to Mr. Watanabe, because he has to leave earlier, and uh, then go to Nai-san. So. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Fujisaki. But I'm uh, sorry, sorry, if you want to talk on other issues as well, like China, right. please do so when you're here, because he has to be leaving in 20 minutes, so. And North Korea is a good topic, actually. Yeah. I intentionally <laughs> didn't talk about North Korea much in yeah. my first remarks. And, uh, 
the, I think, uh, one thing, North Korea's issue, um, MC Yana suggested, we don't know how to, of course, and that big <coughs> question mark. And uh, the big tr trouble for us is uh, uh, what kind of uh, discussion between the U.S. and China? I think uh, I realize that uh, somehow Prime Minister Abe and the President Trump has a good communication, at least in this context. But uh, Japanese side don't know uh, what what a uh, uh, U.S. side is uh, talking about this issue with China and uh, President Trump and Xi Jinping. We don't know, and uh, that is a really the difficult one. We what kind of preparation we should do, or what kind of. Uh, uh, the setting we should prepare our uh, fix. Uh, six party talk type or other one or um, the one clear things that's good the, the foundation is that US, Japan, South Korea. That was uh, good already. Um, I think uh, defense ministers of uh, three countries already confirmed to the cross co cooperation. And uh, but, uh, uh, without China we cannot imagine uh, the picture in the, in, in the future. And also another big worry is uh, that in the past, the U.S. the policy toward North Korea somehow big, uh, how can I say, very fracture, fracturating uh, the policy in the case of uh, the after presidential election. That's nature of the U.S. policy. That's good things for the U.S. policy. US, the, the advantage for the, the changing uh, policy after administration. But as for North Korea, it seems to me North Korea continues to pursue the very one direction of things. But U.S. keep changing. And probably it's about a time for U.S. to think about a serious stage to the, the, the one direction with the, uh, allied partners. Because the final moment, final moment means the, uh, the, it's not serious final, but the, 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 the last step to the, the North Korea may ha have uh, would have uh, the, uh, the ICBM uh, reachable to the U.S. mainland territory. So it's, it's, that's my idea. But what kind of things we should think about it? So I'd like to... The but I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Yanai san said, mm -hmm. let's take North Korea as it is de facto mm -hmm nuclear power. Mm -hmm. Maybe not NPT nuclear power, right. legal nuclear power, mm -hmm. but we cannot expect them to abandon this. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to take them as it is and start negotiations from there on. Do you also take that view? Yeah, I, I agree with the embassy. The reason is simply that, uh, that, of course, we can't accept the nuclear power as a, in an NPT sense because it's a very important for us to pass it to China and the North, uh, China and the Russia. Sorry, in short, do you just first mm -hmm. think that freeze should be there of At the least, uh, freeze. Uh, situation mm -hmm. and then start negotiating? The aim is not to abandon but freeze the situation. Aim is abandon but uh, starting to freeze. But uh, he said. Abandon is not possible. Do you agree with that? Uh, we should not assume the very easy solution for the abandon. But, uh, abandon is a, uh, we cannot abandon to abandon of uh, <laughs> North Korea. That's final reach. But the, in the step, clearly freezing. Because uh, um, first of all, the, if we just the, give up uh, the you see, uh, uh, freeze, is, I'm sorry to come in so often, but freeze is natural step. Mm -hmm. But right. from there on, shall mm -hmm. we uh, can negotiate to have them abandon or not is a very different. Right. That's right. Just to freeze mm -hmm. and the situation or try to go down to zero mm -hmm. from there. Do you think that latter is possible too? Uh, it, it's not sure. At least we should not give up. Uh, I see. I see. Uh, the uh, ab abandoning I of, of uh, nuclear. I see. Uh, uh, do you have any well, I, I tend to agree um, with Ambassador Yanai as well as uh, Watanabe san that uh, we have to keep our long term objective uh, as a non nuclear Korean peninsula. But we also have to be realistic that the Kim regime 
sees nuclear weapons as their claim to legitimacy and survival. So in that sense, uh, we want to uh, freeze the further developments which are threatening in the short run uh, and continue to state our long-term objective, but be realistic that the Kim regime is not going to give up the weapons. On the other hand, uh, the Chinese have proposed what they call freeze for freeze. Uh, the U.S. should uh, basically freeze its exercises with South Korea, uh, in turn for North Korea freezing its uh, tests. And uh, the problem with that is the North Koreans cheat. They've cheated consistently, right back to 1993 in the NPT. They've been. So many people in Washington say, getting a freeze, uh, you know, how would we believe it? So I think what we have to do is uh, push the Chinese much harder. Uh, instead of freeze for freeze, in which we weaken our alliance with South Korea and create uncertainty in South Korea, we have to uh, persuade the Chinese that it's in their interest, if they want stability in North Korea, to be willing to cut off food and fuel to North Korea, which is what they provide, which North Korea depends on, unless the North Koreans not only stop testing of the ballistic missiles, but also the nuclear weapons, and have a very intrusive International Atomic Energy Agency inspection in there. And that you don't trade that for weakening our alliance with South Korea. Similarly, uh, whatever we do, I don't think six-party talks is the right answer because the North Koreans use six-party talks just to delay and obfuscate. But I do think uh, it's essential for the U.S. and Japan to stay very closely uh, aligned on this. And at the end of the Clinton administration, as you remember, we had what we called the Perry process, where former Secretary of Defense Perry was working on this issue. And as you said, we informed Japan every day. I mean, it was a, there was no di Japan wasn't at the table, mm -hmm. but there was absolutely no distance between the U.S. and Japan. And I think some formula like that may be uh, maybe what we have to uh, to use. It's you might call it a combination of realism plus pressure on China to come off the position they've had, which is. To say they keep saying we don't want a nuclear peninsula, and we don't want instability in North Korea, but they clearly prioritize the second of those. We have to say to them, if you don't want instability in North Korea, you're going to have to do a lot more. And when they say, well, we can't, uh, it's true they can't to the point of making Kim give up his weapons, but it's not true that they couldn't stop enough food and fuel to make him do a freeze with IAEA inspection. Uh, Amara-san, do you have any views on this? Uh, Yanai-san uh, uh, has already touched on that, so first me, you, and then uh, we'll come back to Yanai-san. I've forgotten her name, Mrs. Smith of the Council of Foreign Relations. Yeah. Sheila Smith, yeah. Sheila Smith. And uh, she I said I am an economist, uh, not knowing uh, very much about political relations. Uh, so I'll talk about uh, the sort of game theoretic views, and he was, she was frightened. Nobody in this meeting will understand. But uh, there are some wisdom in, not in very, I brought a very formal sort of mathematical book, but uh, actually informal game theory, political science, literature, uh, <coughs> like uh, Robert Axelrod <coughs> and uh, again first name, uh, Mr. Rappaport. Mm -hmm. The best way is tit for tat, not following other, what others would say. So theoretically, the object 
instinctive lesson of human behavior, it's not nationality or anything, but human behavior, or political scientists, uh, are that we should pray broad-minded first, but once the other party reacts unfavorably, you have to get firm mm -hmm. right. uh, commitment and reaction. And uh, I think the examples of uh, Richard Nixon or Ronald Reagan show that Sometimes hawkish attitude may break the ice, and uh, so I am a little more uh, antagonistic about these issues. But I have an assistant who lives in the neighbor of Yokota base and also her husband is from Okinawa. So if I advocate this kind of tit for tat strategy, mm -hmm. then the first place to be bombed or harmed would be Okinawa or Yokota and of course so. Mm -hmm. So this is, again, difficult situation. The ambassador uh, and I said uh, it's to choose, but, but could I ask you yes. a question as an economist? Yes. Um, you are correct that uh, the threat of force yes. is part of the bargaining yes. process. Yes. But if the threat of force is not credible, yeah. it doesn't help. Yes. If you look at the Tokyo stock market, yeah. it's clear nobody believes the threat of force. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you make the threat of force credible so that the, you get bargaining yes. by yeah. the Chinese and the North Koreans uh, without creating your assistant moving her house from Yokota to uh, uh, Hokkaido. Yeah. There are lots of uh, theories on mm -hmm. how to make it credible or in what situations just talk, the cheap talk right. would, would be possible. But I, I, had a quick homework for today, how they can solve the actual situation. It's still very far and very abstract. That's why this kind of analytical or mathematical political science hasn't yet enough influence, I guess. So I, I would just say I would like to, after I resign, Thank you. Uh, before uh, going to Mr. Yana here, uh, because uh, what Anderson has to be leaving now, do you have anything to say? One thing, the question to the, the Professor Nye. Yes. So you said about uh, the, some the stock market issues. So do you still, the, do you, how, how do you believe the probability of the U.S. Uh, pre preemptive military action against North Korea? Well, I think the White House has been um, looking for what they call limited action. So they realized that uh, major action would be disaster, uh, you know, with millions of people killed. This goes all the way back to 1994 when the U.S. considered the possibility of a preemptive strike against the Young Beyond Reprocessing Facility. And the reason we didn't do it was not that it was technically difficult, or not that nuclear weapons were involved. In fact, then the North Koreans didn't have any nuclear weapons. North Korea has 15,000 artillery tubes in the demilitarized zone, and they could do terrible damage to Seoul. Uh, you might call it conventional deterrence. So we didn't use force then. And that situation remains as true today as it did in 1994. So when the White House looks at what they might do to put credibility into the game that uh, Professor Amata mentioned, they talk about very limited strikes. So for example, if you have a missile on the launch pad, you might destroy the missile as it's being launched or something of that sort. 
Then the question is, will that stay limited? Mm. Or will it, you know, Kim Jong-un couldn't reply with a nuclear response because that would uh, mean we would respond and that would with a nuclear and that would be the end of Kim Jong-un. Mm. And he's not suicidal. Mm. The question is, if the US tried a limited response, would he accept that? Or would he use some of those artillery <coughs> tubes to, you, you don't have to drop many missiles in Seoul to destroy the Seoul Stock Exchange. I mean, the prices would go down. So would the Tokyo prices go down and the world would, would be affected. So the, it goes back to this one shot. <laughs> you know, if you, have, uh, if you have what the White House thinks of as very limited, will that be seen as very limited in Pyongyang, or will it turn out to be the one shot? And that's the big conundrum. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Can, can they identify uh, the whereabout of him uh, like uh, they did with uh, Osama bin Laden? <laughs> There's their people who are studying that, yeah, but I don't yeah. think anybody has confidence mm. on that. Oh, okay, yeah. let's go back to Yanai san on this issue well, of Korea. <clears throat> well, um, although I'm rather pessimistic about uh, the outcome of uh, possible negotiations with North Korea, uh, but of course I'm not against the idea of uh, having as a long-term target uh, the abandoned by the North Korea of uh, nuclear weapons and uh, missile uh, program. Uh, and um, I'm not against the idea of uh, setting a mid-term uh, target of freezing uh, their program. Uh, but about the freezing, even the freezing is not, it's not easy uh, because as we all remember, during the 1990s uh, nuclear crisis, uh, under the framework agreement, uh, North Korea once accepted the inspection by the IAEA, yeah. Yeah. but uh, at, uh, in the end, uh, they kicked out the inspectors uh, and uh, they uh, resumed the nuclear program. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if uh, <clears throat> suppose if uh, North Korea accepts the, the freezing uh, with the inspection of the IAEA, uh, there is no guarantee that uh, they would uh, do the same thing, uh, namely to kick out uh, IAEA inspectors. Yep. Uh, so what to do? <laughs> and my question is um, that uh, without inspection, uh, if they agree to not to launch uh, ICBM uh, test uh, uh, missile or not to uh, initiate any uh, nuclear uh, explosion, uh, would that be um, sufficient? Uh, in other words, uh, the launching of uh, ICBM uh, test uh, uh, model uh, or the, uh, uh, the nuclear blast uh, could be seen from outside uh, without inspection. Uh, would that be uh, useful uh, or uh, is there any other ways to uh, verify the, the freezing. That is my question. Yeah. Well, there's some value in um, uh, having a, uh, a ban on launches and, uh, and nuclear tests because the you can make progress on the nuclear weapons uh, at so-called in the laboratory. Yeah, yeah. Uh, without the test, mm -hmm. though you're not sure how that works mm -hmm. out. With the missile, it's much harder. Mm -hmm. In other words, particularly with an ICBM, mm -hmm. where you have to uh, not only question whether it will be launched, but mm -hmm. how will it re-enter the atmosphere. And as it re-enters the atmosphere, uh, the mm -hmm. nose cone of the mm -hmm. missile suffers enormous pressure and yeah, heat. Yeah, yeah. 
and if it vibrates too much, it may break up, or if it, uh, or it may lose the accuracy that it needs for targeting and so forth. So to really have an ICBM, which is a threat, does require testing. So a test ban uh, on these launches could uh, be of some value. And as you said, the, the, the proof is when you see the launch. Um, but it would be nice also to have um, IEA inspectors going to the nuclear laboratories. It's, as you said, it's not clear the North Koreans would allow that, or if they allowed it, that they would refrain from kicking them out. So it might be that just the, the test ban and the launch ban would be the interim steps. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, what what I son has to go now, so uh, uh, the remaining uh, four will uh, continue to discuss. Uh, as I was asked as a moderator, I'm not going to. Uh, I think uh, Mita san don't want to, me to express my view, but still, I'm going to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, my views are a little, little, little different from my, some others. Uh, one is that uh, I think we are getting into the chicken game now. Yeah. So it's very important that uh, we shouldn't say that please don't use uh, military weapons or don't say everything on the table uh, to North Koreans because uh, uh, we don't, uh, we are scared of that because in a way we are in the game already mm. and uh, of course it's a bit scary because on both sides only one person decides in the end Kim Jong-un and Trump. Mm -hmm. So it, it's scary but uh, this is the game. Second point, I think a lot of us made a mistake of thinking that North Korea in the end wanted a peace treaty with the United States and uh, some security assurance. I don't think so. Uh, they cheat treaties, as you mm -hmm. said, so they're not asking for treaty. They want their self-assurance by themselves. That's the very basic point. The point I don't agree with was that uh, the past negotiations, some of them Without Japan in it, we were just briefed. I don't think we should have that again. Uh, six party talks is much better, even if it was not really effective. Because uh, this is concerned security of us most mm -hmm. as a neighboring country. And we can't task others to be the negotiator and brief us. We have seen some of the issues that we didn't want to see. For example, if I may say, three weeks after Tepodon first one flew over Japan, the United States offered food aid to North Korea, 98 it was. We don't want to see something like that. It's a very, uh, because that time, Japan was not that alert, but it's more alert now, so, that would bring about some psychological rift between Japan and the United States. If, uh, second point, uh, as what ICBM thing, this sounds very paradoxical because, uh, because of the extension of missile. Now US and Japan is on one boat together. Before it was not so. US was a little bit more relaxed it was more concerned about missile technology or missile export than its missile launch itself. Because RBM only went for seven, uh, 1,700 kilometers. Now it goes for, so it's US problem as well. So what they did with Tapadon 1 is not happening now. We have to be mindful of that. And I, I don't think we want to see only ban of uh, ICBMs, because they already have many IRBMs, so this is an uh, issue. Lastly, uh, no, uh, uh, about uh, uh, sanction, I think it's important, because the first time we were able to come to uh, oil and oil products uh, cut, uh, after nine, uh, in the ninth uh, Security Council resolution, I think uh, we have come to this. And so I think it's important that we would 
apply this, and as Mr. Trump says, we have to strengthen that as it goes if uh, North Korea doesn't cooperate. And of course, uh, China has the key role in that. And I think uh, that's a good sign that China may be cooperating. The September 9th report of the United Nations says that uh, Ch China is cooperating with export on uh, import on coal. Uh, coal. They are not importing coal. So North Korea is now exporting to Malaysia and Vietnam. So China, in the end, may be uh, becoming more serious than before. That's uh, something we have to take into account. And uh, I, much as I think uh, we ha have trust in the United States, I think this time we should be always be in the negotiations uh, try to be in itself. Or maybe North Korea doesn't want it. I, my nightmare was during Clinton administration, four party talks started. Republic of Korea initiated that, and ROK, China, North Korea, and United States. I think we don't want to see anything like that. Uh, maybe you have something to say on that. No, I, I, I agree with that. I, I and mean, the key. <coughs> Uh, for U.S. policy has to remain uh, the U.S.-Japan relationship. I mean, that's the uh, the bedrock of American strategy. So anything that shapes that would be a huge mistake. On the other hand, it's also worth remembering that um, if there is a chaos in North Korea, and troops have to be sent in to try to capture and control the nuclear weapons or to prevent uh, fighting and so forth, that's going to have to be a deal between the U.S. and China. We can't have 1950 and Americans mm -hmm. approaching the Yalu River and the Chinese coming in and so forth. So at some point, the Americans and Chinese are going to have to talk to each other about this. If one asks, Will the SDF be sent to North Korea? Clearly not, uh, because of the Constitution. And, and so in that sense, the, the, the US and China are going to have to negotiate with each other. Uh, then the question is, how do we do this in a way that doesn't undercut our very close relations with Japan and South Korea? And, so I, I agree, four-party talks would be a big uh, mistake. I don't think the North Koreans need to be part of this because we're talking about intervention of U.S. and China into North Korea to prevent the North Korean uh, chaos leading to the escape of nuclear weapons or technology. So uh, that's why I'm a little skeptical that six-party talks okay. will do it. I'm happy to have six-party talks as, one, as long as we're realistic that when you have the North Koreans sitting at the table, not much is going to happen. Do you think a joint intervention of China and the United States is a, good, is a possibility? Well, you know, Henry Kissinger has been talking about mm -hmm. this in Washington, mm -hmm. and I think he's probably right. I mean, I think if the... Right now, the Chinese um, uh, and the Americans talk about uh, the, the North Korean situation. The Chinese say, yes, 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 but they don't do much. <laughs> I mean, they do a little, just enough to keep us quiet, but they don't do enough. I think the Americans and the Chinese should sit down quietly without the North Koreans and say, if you don't want chaos on your border, realize that, uh, as Professor Hamad has said, Trump is a little bit uh, dangerous, mm -hmm. he might use force. Mm -hmm. If you're going to prevent this, we better have a plan so that if something happens in North Korea, we don't wind up with Chinese and Americans fighting each other. We've seen that once. Does that mean that the U.S. may allow China to go in I don't think take control of this I don't country. think we want to have the the Chinese own North Korea. The North Koreans don't want that uh, either. But one could imagine, let's say, uh, uh, the U.S. and China agreeing that 
the troops would pave the way for broader peacekeeping forces mm -hmm. which would restore order in uh, North Korea. This assumes the Kim regime would have collapsed or something. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't think we want to see raising the 38th parallel higher on the peninsula with the Chinese on one side of the Americans. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, and I think what Kissinger is getting at, is that for the Chinese to be brave enough to actually cut both food and oil and press the North Koreans hard, they have to be reassured that the Americans aren't going to take advantage of that by expanding the American influence uh, up toward China, up toward the Yalu River. So what Henry has been saying, uh, as I understand it, is, uh, uh, and I've talked to him about this a little bit, uh, is that we and the Chinese have to talk and we have to reassure the Chinese we're not seeking advantage on the peninsula, but we are serious that uh, the current way in which they've played this which is to smile and say yes, 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 and do as little as possible is no longer acceptable. So that's, I think, the, the gist of what the Kissinger proposal is. But, it, but if we do that, uh, it's clearly uh, got to be something where both Tokyo and Seoul are informed and agree that this is in the interest, in their interest. And you don't think Russians would take advantage of this? They may. I mean, the Russians are now in the role of a spoiler, and they may, in fact, provide uh, uh, fuel to, uh, to, to North Korea. I don't think they're in a strong enough position to actually uh, change that. In other words, I don't think... If you say, can the Russians save Kim Jong-un, I don't think so. Uh, I think the key to what happens is still China. And I think the Chinese have played this game of, of give the Americans as little as possible, but just enough to get them to shut up. And I think what Trump is saying is that game isn't going to work anymore. In that sense, uh, Mr. Trump's uh, uh, playing of the game is uh, better than before? Than well, to, uh, ironically, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not a Trump supporter. Yeah, but let no, me no, go no. back to yeah, Professor yeah, yeah. Nevada's uh, game theory, which is if you're in a game of chicken, um, you have to uh, make the opponent think that you are going to do something really stupid. Yes. So, you know, Tom Schelling, who was a great, uh, my former colleague and a great game theorist, to say if you're having two drivers coming at each other and you're trying to say which one is going to swerve off the road, the driver who takes the steering wheel and holds it out the window is going to be more credible. <laughs> uh, now, what's to prevent you from having a spare steering wheel in the front seat? <laughs> and if the other guy, driver thinks you have a spare steering wheel, <laughs> you know, does it work or not? But the point is that, uh, that because, I mean, Trump's rhetoric is, is terrible, but, it may, but if it's enough to make the Chinese think this guy is strange, and, and, you know, it's Nixon's famous madman theory. And, uh, you know, if, if the Chinese decided Trump may be a madman, they might actually be more willing to change their policy than they were for a reasonable president like Obama. Uh, cooperation may, as they say, if uh, in a trembling hand, if other guys incredible, that may even achieve more cooperation. Right. There is another issue about Japan, which is a little bit related. Is, uh, of course, if real nuclear war, maybe if I could destroy North Korea and some other countries, including Japan, Korea, but uh, minister Sakaya, uh, former economics minister, told me he is worried about the refugees. Yeah. And uh, Japan is a very peaceful country because of its geographical locations and history. It 
is not saved by any kind of large flow of refugees. If North Korean refugees comes to this island, it would be very serious, and the Japanese are not accustomed to that kind of shocks. Now uh, we have uh, 30 minutes, so uh, 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 let's uh, finish the uh, North Korean issue here and uh, change to China. Uh, they have just uh, been in the uh, party congress, so and not only focusing on uh, party or congress or domestic issues, uh, in Chinese foreign policy, two things are rather problemsome or difficult for us. One is, well, there are many things, but it, it, put it very simple, two things. One, fait accompli, or done things are done, like South China Sea, or uh, if they just go ahead and do things, they think that it's done and they would not go back, even after a lot of uh, criticism. Well, it's the same with uh, Crimea and Ukraine of uh, Russia. Can, how should we be de dealing with that? Second issue is sort of uh, coming up with ideas, maybe sometimes good, but uh, without consultation, AIIB, O-B-O-R, they just are presented, if you want to go come in, don't miss the bus. Uh, some, some of us are concerned that they may come up with some ideas on political and security field, institution in Asia. And we hope this will not happen, but if we let these just one-sided announcement without consultation, without discussion, like TPP, that has been negotiated for four years, but AIIB, OBR, just come up. So I would like you to discuss, if possible, those two elements of uh, Chinese foreign policy, OBO. Well, what's interesting is <clears throat> it, the Chinese are torn between uh, accepting the international order which they benefited from. Mm -hmm. and that's the Xi Jinping who goes to Davos and talks about standing up for globalization and free trade. And on the other hand, being free riders. Mm -hmm. And that's the China who uh, replies to uh, the Law of the Sea Tribunal that Ambassador Yanai knows so well, uh, which comes out with a judgment against them and ignores it. And so you have uh, essentially a Chinese behavior, which is, uh, they, they, it can go in either of two directions. On some things, when you look at Chinese behavior over time, it's improved. Look at their position on climate. Uh, they, in, at Copenhagen in 2009, they were a spoiler. In Paris in 2015, they were uh, uh, one of the leaders mm -hmm. and uh, in producing a global public good. And uh, so you, 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 our job, U.S. and Japan, and with Europe and others, is to try to shape the international environment to encourage China toward good behavior. That's why, for example, on something like uh, South China Sea, uh, it's essential uh, that we not let them get away with rejection of the tribunal results. It's very clear under the law of the sea that you can't pour sand on a rock and call it an island with a territorial sea. But it's not enough for the U.S. or Japan to say that. We have to persuade the Europeans, the Australians, and others that they have to say it as well, that this is an international consensus. And uh, uh, Similarly, the Americans have to continue. Uh, what we're doing now is sailing our warships through this falsely claimed 12-mile limit on these artificial islands on freedom of navigation operations. So again, this is, is 
uh, you know, a positive and a negative incentive to say, when you act like a free rider, you'll suffer. But when you act uh, in a beneficial way, as you did on Climber or something, you will benefit. So I think that's the strategy we ought to be uh, approaching. So when you apply that to uh, uh, AIIB and to the One Belt, One Road, uh, with, one, with AIIB, to the extent that it means that instead of Chinese money being sent to uh, Angola or Zimbabwe as a slush fund for pure political purposes, it now has an international board which says there have to be accounts. There have to be, you know, we have to see books. We have to see what's really going on here. And that could be a, a, a plus. Doesn't mean Japan and the US have to join it, but as Obama told Abe in 2015, after our initial rejection of it, we changed, we said, go ahead. I mean, let's cooperate with it on a case by case basis. And I think the same thing is true for One Belt, One Road, which is more of a, uh, of a slogan than a strategy. I mean, it's when That's you ask. Just, sorry, you know, Joseph, I'm not talking about the content itself, but the way they come up. Oh, no, I, you know, I mean, that's, and I think what we have to do is, is to say that if they want cooperation, they'd better uh, do a better job in consultation. Yeah. And, uh, but I think on a case by case yes. basis, we can uh, both have actions that encourage good behavior. And we can have declaratory policy that say, if you want our cooperation, you've got to change the way you do it. But I, I'd be curious to hear Esther and I, uh, in the aftermath of the Law of the Sea Tribunal, which you put so many uh, hours into, where do you think we stand and what do you think we should do? I mean, is my approach correct or are other things we should be doing? <coughs> well, uh about uh, the uh, South China Sea, uh, I have to make it clear that um, it was uh, an arbitration right. that, that uh, dealt with that, that case. Yeah. And uh, my role was just to appoint arbitrators. Right. Uh, <clears throat> having said that, uh, it is of course uh, regrettable that uh, China completely ignores the award uh, of the arbitration. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> like in the case of uh, North Korea's uh, nuclear program, uh, China would not uh, abandon the uh, filling of uh, those uh, shallow waters to make uh, artificial islands. But uh, on our side, on the, uh, on the Japanese and the US uh, side, and also on the, the side of uh, many other countries that have interest in the, in the, uh, the sea, seas and oceans, should not accept that, uh, uh, accept their, their uh, behavior. Uh, so they, we, we have to keep uh, claim against uh, that, uh, uh, that kind of uh, Chinese uh, behavior. But um, other than that, so, so as you said, uh, we have to send uh, our uh, ships through uh, that uh, waters. Uh, but if we go beyond that, that, that would uh, uh, lead to uh, an armed conflict. So that is uh, a very, very difficult situation. Uh, but, uh, as you said, uh, Joe, um, I also think that uh, China is also changing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I think uh, the climate change uh, you mentioned is a very good example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the same can be said about uh, trade issues. So, of course, uh, uh, sovereignty issues are much more difficult. Right. But still, uh, China I, I think China would uh, become a more, more stable uh, player in the world. Hamada uh, Sensei, do you have your views on China, please? Uh, uh, Japanese elites come from 
Yoka town or Tokyo, and uh, they, tend, unlike me, tend to go back to Japan after educated in foreign countries and so forth, and uh, respect past tradition and so forth. When we look at and the past is working quite a lot. However, if we look at chess broadcasting in television and so forth, Japanese commentators always talk back. He shouldn't have played that. But I, I once saw an American chess program. They don't say, once masters play this way, we should always look forward. And uh, I think Chinese people have more intentions to go abroad to be independently successful rather than by his hometown or his group. Uh, so I think this uh, Chinese attitude is, uh, uh, in a sense, in sometimes merit uh, for making their country very active. My, my view is that uh, uh, Xi Jinping is uh, very ambitious. He's trying to push China's national positions uh, a little bit too uh, too fast, too quickly. But uh, that if the U.S. and Japan and India continue to create a, an environment to shape the environment, we can create incentives for China to behave well. This is not the same as containment, it's, it's, you might call it, shaping the environment. I was uh, with a group of Indians in Washington um, at a strategic dialogue last weekend, and what struck me is the way the Chinese behavior on the border with India uh, the, and Bhutan, this so-called Doklan episode of last summer, really poisoned attitudes in India. So if China is interested in doing well, let's say, improving its trade in India, uh, which they are interested in, then they've got to learn to control some of their uh, military pressure. And uh, on the same thing is true with Vietnam, where the Chinese uh, pressure on offshore dwelling in uh, the Paracels led to anti-Chinese riots. Vietnam. So I think there is not a question of uh, containment, it's a question of, of China realizing that uh, if it wants to increase its trade position and increase its soft power, it has to limit some of its uh, hard power operations. And uh, I, I think that it's a decision that the Chinese are going to have to make. But by being too aggressive and too uh, uh, too nationalistic, uh, they're turning uh, other countries against them. We don't have to contain them. I call it self-containment by China. Mm -hmm. In other words, every time they they uh, do something that drives the Indians crazy or drives the Vietnamese crazy, they contain themselves. No, thank you very much. I think uh, we are close to end. In 10 or 15 minutes we have to close, so uh, I would like uh, each of you uh, to make a three or four minutes uh, to conclude and uh, maybe uh, rather than talking, going back to North Korea um, or uh, China, uh, for example, uh, uh, Dr. Nye has uh, issued a report uh, two times with Mr. Armitage about uh, uh, security of Japan and uh, advice us uh, collective self-defense, which uh, we've done uh, partly. And uh, now uh, is, uh, maybe each of us can say anything should be done in or should not be done in uh, U.S.-Japan.
context. Uh, any, any of you could uh, yes. start. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'm not trying to conclude uh, uh, our discussions, but uh, I would rather raise another uh, uh, issue. Uh, we haven't discussed uh, the uh, one factor, which is uh, the ROK, mm. because uh, there is a, a rather populist uh, president, uh, that is uh, Mr. Moon Jae-in. And uh, <coughs> as we all know, uh, during his predecessor's time, Park uh, Geun-hye's time, uh, Japan and uh, the ROK reached an agreement concerning the so-called comfort women issue. Uh, and under, under that agreement, uh, the ROK will not uh, uh, continue the anti-Japanese uh, campaign uh, using uh, the comfort women issue. Uh, and uh, rather, the, he, uh, the ROK should uh, uh, should uh, prohibit uh, the uh, placing of uh, comfort women in uh, statutes everywhere. Uh, but Moon uh, <coughs> Jae-in uh, totally ignored that. Uh, rather, the, this uh, issue is uh, proliferating all over the world. We are very much concerned. And uh, not only that, uh, the issue is uh, we are being expanded to another uh, issue, uh, old issue, of uh, so-called uh, forced labor uh, issue. Uh, as you know, uh, during, um, during the, the war, uh, the, the Koreans, uh, which had Japanese nationality, were forced to, to work in uh, many uh, factories in Japan. And uh, this, uh, another issue is uh, coming up with this. And uh, <coughs> we are very much annoyed about that. But uh, I'd like to know if, uh, Joe, you have any uh, idea uh, to contain this uh, kind of uh, uh, negative uh, well, it's, it, it, it's very difficult to contain populism anywhere, as you know, um, including in the United States. We now are having these uh, internal uh, disputes about statues and, uh, and uh, demonstrations about Confederate statues and flags and so forth. So the politics of symbolism are, are extraordinarily difficult to control in democracies. And uh, what the United States has tried to do is say to Koreans, uh, look ahead. Looking back doesn't do you any good. Look ahead, and as you look ahead, you'll see you have major problems north of the border and major opportunities. And so we've been trying to encourage better U.S., uh, uh, Japan, our uh, ROK trilateral uh, relations, as well as bilateral Japan uh, ROK relations. But as you point out, not always with great success. But I think the best we can do is to, is to keep pressing that. And then obviously uh, for Japan, uh, the more you can have politicians avoid doing things which uh, uh, provide excuse for populists mm -hmm. in Korea to, uh, to do something foolish, uh, the better. I mean, this goes to the famous uh, uh, visits to the Yasukuni Shrine and so forth. Mm -hmm. you know, it, the more that Japan can try to avoid giving excuses to the populists in Korea, the better. And the more the Americans can try to moderate that behavior, the better. But uh, I'd like to say that uh, we know how to control it. The answer is we don't even know how to control it in our own country. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you very much. Uh, no, I'm going to humble us on, but uh, one thing I wanted to ask, you can say anything, but I wanted to ask you is that uh, Nisan said in the outset uh, that uh, 
the U.S. administration is good on security side, but on trade side, a bit worrisome. And uh, one thing, we are not that concerned about the one trade issue, or whatever, but if the U.S. is really trying to shake Bretton Woods or the WTO IMF system itself, it's going to be a huge problem. But do, are you worried that uh, this is happening as well? Probably only partly worried about it. There are many issues in trade or monetary arrangement. And one approach is WTO. You gather all nations and discuss there uh, in a systematic way and almost legalize some of the conventions and the practices. And that is a nice way, but the transaction cost of having meetings and so forth and keeping bureaucracies. That has some cost. So I understand that you, you have some, some of the issues can be solved by mutually advantageous way between two countries, say US and Japan. So there are both ways of solving it. And uh, TPP was uh, looked like a nice compromise between the very aggregate. Mm -hmm. approach and individual approach, but it didn't work. So uh, some of uh, the rigidity of large institutions uh, may be amended a little more flexibly. And I'd like to add one footnote to was a nice formal remark about India, India-China relationship. Uh, unfortunately, wind blows always from west to east, so the <coughs> pollution problem in China is damaging to us very much. So mm -hmm. usual reaction is uh, China is a bad guy in uh, pollution or environmental protection is a concern. But, uh, a Nobel economist, Ronald Coase, uh, long time ago argued that if somebody may look as a defend, uh, not as an aggressor, uh, sometimes it is uh, more profitable for participants to pay the apparent aggressor. So if we can cooperate in financial resources, and probably most likely, in the uh, preferably in terms of uh, technology, some clearing effect of air and water in China, that would be not only beneficial to China, but eventually to be beneficial to Japan. Mm -hmm. And uh, the answer to your question is just half and half. Sometimes it's good to have joint approach. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are coming close to the end. And uh, about our relations with the uh, neighboring countries, China and uh, ROK, Republic of Korea, I am uh, uh, telling to my students uh, always that uh, you should remember, learn this hundred years of history since uh, Meiji and what we did to China. Korea or Asia. Without knowing that, really, we don't understand their feeling and the emotion. And uh, sometimes we jump to hate speeches too easily without really knowing what we did to them. So we should learn, look back. Yeah. And for them, I'm telling to Chinese students and uh, Korean students, if U.S. always talked about Pearl Harbor, and if he always talked about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 
it's important to remember that. But if we always in all meetings, we wouldn't have come to this stage. So let's look at future and look at big issue and where we can cooperate more. Because ROK and Japan relations is a little unfortunate. When North Korea is bad boy, we come together. But if uh, they become little quiet, then we, we start uh, uh, discussing. And I, I don't think it should be like that. So it's already 70 years past the uh, war, so we really have to come to a little bit more mature relations. I thought it was great that President Obama tried to weigh in and uh, try to go between two pres uh, leaders of Japan and ROK. But in sh very frankly, I thought, what a shame. Why do we have to rely on foreign countries to, <laughs> on that? So I think uh, we should establish that uh, relations in the long term. But uh, uh, I think we had a very good uh, talks today on uh, United States politics, uh, foreign policy, North Korea, China, and uh, a bit about economy and game theory as well, uh, thanks to Amala san So uh, thank you very much. And uh, it was great that uh, Joe san has uh, pleasure. been here in Japan for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your excellent. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.